It's Mark Yegi here, Wealth Architect and Lifestyle Investor. Let's take your life to the next level. Welcome to the Wealth Architect Podcast. Hey, everybody. It's Mark Yegi. Welcome to another edition of the Wealth Architect Podcast. Glad you're here. Today, we have a distinguished professor, consultant, researcher, and author with a wealth of experience that offers unique insights into the concepts of chance and luck, two concepts that we really want to get exploring today. He holds a BA in math and a PhD in statistics, God bless him, from the University of California at Berkeley. Throughout his career, this gentleman has made a significant contribution in the field of statistics, in the gaming industry especially, where he frequently serves as a consultant. Let's go ahead and welcome our guest today, Dr. Michael Orkin. Dr. Orkin, welcome. Well, thank you, Mark. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you. And so you um, you got into this science of chance and luck. Why don't you tell us a little bit of the backstory about how you got into this particular fascinating field? Okay, well, I started out um, as a math major at uh, Cal, UC Berkeley, a long time ago. And uh, I was planning to just go into uh, uh, programming. I'd worked for IBM over the summer, but then when I was a senior, I took a probability course with a professor who was very inspiring, and he asked me if I wanted to go to graduate school. So I said, well, I'm not sure. Um, do I have to fill out a lot of forms? And he said, no, um, just uh, sign your name here. And I did. And so I went to, they had a great statistics department there, but um, about half the department faculty specialized in probability, and that was the thing I was interested in, probability, chance, things like that. So I got my PhD and I went into teaching at a California State University and research. I did a bunch of research. And then I started um, over time getting uh, some consulting jobs and in, involving um, the gaming industry in general. And then uh, more recent years when um, internet gaming has sort of exploded, especially with uh, the relaxation of laws on sports betting. There are a number of developers who have um, want to put their apps on the on the App Store or on the Android uh, store. And in order to do that, one of the things they have to do is satisfy regulators. And for some reason, games have, generally speaking, have to be a game of skill rather than a game of chance, which means that you can study and learn how to be good at it. Hmm. And so they need a need a, some kind of a um, a blessing from a statistician saying, saying, yes, this really is the game of skill based on data. And so I started doing that and I've done numerous, uh, worked for numerous companies and numerous apps, all involving uh, skill versus chance. And um, to give you a little background, there are some games, uh, and all the, all the things that I've been doing lately have involved wagering. And if you go to a casino, that's sort of the home, the temple of wagering. Sure. And um, there are some games that are just, you can show mathematically, are games of pure chance. You can't develop any skill, like craps, rolling the dice. You can cheat, of course, but I'm not counting that as skill. Craps, roulette, um, if you go outside the casino, lotteries. And those games, I can start rolling dice and uh, play for a long period of time. And somebody who's never rolled a pair of dice before can come in and has the same chance of winning as I do. Not true in other games, for example, blackjack. Right. And blackjack uh, was a game that people thought was a game of chance. The casinos did anyway. And then back in the late 1950s, some computer uh, people at IBM, in fact, um, wrote programs to simulate using Monte Carlo simulation to simulate the game of blackjack because it's too complicated to figure out analytically. And they found good strategies that are sort of complicated to use. You have to keep track of the cards. But that showed that blackjack could be a game of skill. And so... Um, I was always interested. I, I did a bunch of consulting for the head odds maker in Las Vegas, uh, who's still a friend of mine. He's retired now. Uh, Roxy Roxborough is his name. And he computerized the 
sports betting industry in, um, in Nevada and therefore in the rest of the country. And so anyway, here I am. That's a that's a fantastic backstory, and I, I want to try to tie our two stories together a little bit because yeah. I'm uh, I'm a big stock market guy. In fact, I have a YouTube channel for covered calls, and covered calls were essentially uh, brought to the market by a guy I'm sure you know. His name is Edward Thorpe. Sure, he's the one who wrote. He's the guy who did put blackjack. Exactly, he wrote a category dealer, yeah. right? Yeah, and he wrote a book called Beat the Market as well. Yes, he did, and that book I read when I was a 15 year old kid. And it's totally changed my life. And that was 40 something years ago. And I'm still teaching the concepts that were in that book today. So I uh, in I try to structure uh, all of my stock market, you know, teachings around probability. And, uh, you know, when you when you buy a stock, you have a 50 percent chance of being right and you have a 50 percent chance of being wrong. So how do you inch the probabilities in your favor? Well, you learn to you know, figure out where the trends are, where the support and resistance line are, just to get a couple of percentage points probabilistically on your side. Of course, you'll never be 100% right, but I can get it up to about, let's say, 77%. And it's all based on everything that Edward Thorpe talked about. He's still alive. He's in his mid-90s, and he's in unreal shape. I saw a recent uh, interview with him. So uh, what do you know about him, and how can you tie us all together here? Well, Ed Thorpe was a professor, math professor at UC Irvine, and uh, he was he came he he wrote the book Beat the Dealer. That was his first book about uh, blackjack strategies, which involved using the putting the computer simulations that the IBM folks did um, into a form that anybody could look at and and develop a card what's called a card counting strategy in blackjack, and he tested it before he wrote the book, and he went and won a whole bunch of money in a couple of casinos. And um, you in, in getting a and having a good blackjack strategy, you have to do the same thing that you were talking about in a in the stock market. Namely, you have to get a situation where just a little bit better than 50-50 in the case of blackjack. Right. Because the odds are generally one to one, not always. And so if you get um uh, something slightly better than, and, and he did. He got he his strategies gave the player about uh, the player who could keep track of the cards as they were dealt out of the deck. Not an easy thing to do in a crowded casino. Um, gave the player about uh, overall average about a 50, 51, 52 uh, percent probability of winning. Yeah, and that's enough, provided that you have a good money management strategy. That's right. Now that's tripped up a lot of smart people over the years because they think, hey, they have what's called positive EV. EV stands for expected value. Right. Hard to compute. It's easy to compute in the casino. It's much harder to compute out in places in places like the stock market because things are things keep changing and some of the probabilities are estimated. You don't can't compute them easily. But still, the same principles apply. And expected value is your average winnings in repeated play. And if you do the same thing over and over again by the law of averages, you can show in some situations that um, on the average you'll do well or you'll do poorly. Like in, if you bet on seven and craps over and over again, you'll lose about 17 cents for every dollar you bet in the long run. So there's a missing factor here, and that is luck. So yeah. luck means that you can actually win in a game with negative EV or expected value. and um, But luck, unfortunately, for people who like to use luck or think they have luck, it's, luck is dependent on chance, and it disappears in the long run. So after a while, if you're playing a game like craps, you can get lucky, you can win, but if you keep playing luck disappears because of the law of averages. And um, so what that sort of, I mean, that, that's sort of a, a, a strong statement. What it really means is that as, as play progresses, then eventually fewer and fewer people will be lucky. And right. if I play and I get lucky, I should quit because if I, do, in a game with pure chance, because after eventually, whatever that means, but eventually, 
I'll st- my luck will disappear. And yeah. so some people were are experts at finding situations in the real world that have positive EV, that is, gives them a positive average return over time. And so, unfortunately, that's not enough. And a good example of that, which is, I have a chapter in my book about this, is the well-known SBF, Sam Bankman-Fried, sure. who um, is now, unfortunately, in prison, or fortunately, whatever, I'm not going to talk about legal issues, but there was a... a a guy um, wrote a book about in which he had many interviews with SBF before he got in trouble uh, called Number Go Up by Zeke Foe, F-A-U-X. And in those interviews, the Sam Bankman Freed liked to talk about positive EV. He went to MIT, has a degree in math and physics, smart guy. But w- w- here's what he would do when he spotted, and it's not so, it's not so clear cut, in the crypto world or in, in, in any world, not inside a casino, but he would think he had positive EV because he was smarter than everybody else. Right. And well, maybe he was, I'm not going to contest that. But unfortunately, when he would find positive EV situations, he would bet everything. And you can't do that because even in a situation like what you were talking about with covered calls or what I was talking about with blackjack, if you bet everything you have each time that you bet, and you even if you have positive EV, there's a pretty good chance that you'll lose some of the time. And as yeah. soon as you lose, you'll go broke. Because you lose it all. You lose too much. That's right. That's so, the Kelly, I think I studied the Kelly criterion. That's right. right the, yeah, that's right, Mark. The Kelly criterion is sort of the, the benchmark of good money management strategies, and it's called a fixed fraction strategy which means you always bet a fraction of the amount of money you have. So the more you have, the more you bet, the less you have, the less you bet. And it protects you against going broke um, in situations where you have positive EV. And if you keep playing, you'll, you'll do okay. You'll win. Right. And so um, that, so when Sam, when SBF started making bets that were not fixed fraction strategies like the Kelly criteria. He quickly got into trouble and wound up borrowing from people who didn't know that he was borrowing from them. And then uh, eventually that led to his downfall. Among yeah, them. usually usually components of leverage, uh, you know, you, if, if you're leveraging, you're probably violating the fractional strategy. Yeah. And therefore the leverage exacerbates the downsides and things happen so much faster than they would have happened. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And so and that and that generally so that that happens um, in just in any endeavor where you even if you have positive EV, if you start doing things like that, you have to be very careful because you're um, you're wagering more than you can afford to lose, so to speak. All right. So now how does that how does that translate into into life because we all want to learn how to get lucky. I, I have a, a friend of mine who's uh, on in my mastermind group. I have a mastermind group where we we talk about covered calls every week. And you know, when he buys a stock, the joke is, "You buy the stock, let me know so that I can short sell it and make money on the way down." So, how is it that some people have luck in their life, and and maybe uh, some people have the opposite? And how can we get luck on our side? Maybe maybe there's a concept that we can talk about there. And if not, we'll go to something else. But that seems like a good question. Okay, right? well, let me give you an example of uh, what one of the things you were mentioning, and that is the Mega Millions Lottery. So the Mega Millions Lottery is a multi-state lottery. You can, you can buy a lot, Mega Millions or Powerball tickets in just about every state in the country. And um, you can win millions of dollars if you win the jackpot. Right. Unfortunately, the chance of winning the jackpot is about one in 303 million. And that's a very low probability. People have trouble understanding low probabilities, including mathematicians. For example, if you buy 106, if you buy 50 mega millions lottery tickets a week, you'll win the jackpot on the average of once every 116,000 years. <laughs> if you have to drive a mile every time you buy a mega millions ticket, you'll have to make an average You'll drive an average distance of 633 round trips to the moon before you win the jackpot. And so, and one other analogy, 
if you know one person in Canada and put everyone who lives in Canada, everyone in Canada's name on pieces of paper, put in a giant hat, close your eyes and draw out a name at the same time, buy a Mega Millions lottery ticket, you're nine times more likely to pick your friend's name out of the entire population of Canada than you are to win the jackpot. Well, that's interesting. It helps understand low probabilities. But a natural question arises, and that is, how come there are winners if the chances are so low? And in fact, there are winners. Every few weeks, there's a, typically a, a, a jackpot winner. And if, the, if there's a, a long period where there's no winner, then then the, the jackpot builds up and more people buy tickets and then someone wins. That's right. So how come that happens? What's the explanation? What's the phenomenon, natural phenomenon that explains why there are jackpot winners in the face of such uncertainty? And the answer is because so many tickets are sold. <laughs> and in a word, that is opportunity that translates into other things. Luck is, a, luck is an opportunity-based phenomenon. If something's very unlikely, it'll happen. In fact, two um, statisticians named... Percy Diaconis and William Mosteller many years ago called this the law of truly large numbers, which was paraphrasing, given enough opportunity, any weird thing will happen just due to chance. Right. So if you're interested in being lucky, um, you have to really be a part of the opportunity. With the Mega Millions Lottery, for every lucky winner, there's a group of about 303 million unlucky losers. And now that fluctuates from time to time, but we're talking about long-term averages. So you can't, so the definition of luck involves chance. Luck is a phenomenon that's chance-based. If you have skill, that's a completely different thing. Luck is different from skill. And so um, if you have a, in your daily life, if you keep doing things and you have a, sort of a, you protect yourself against going broke, which everyone should do, then you will get lucky from time to time. But there's no way that you can use skill to influence that. Interesting. Hey, it's Mark Yeager here to tell you about our cash flow machine trading program that's designed to teach you how to make safe, reliable income. Now we shoot for two to 4% a month of income and growth in your portfolio. And we have courses to teach you how to do this yourself or inside a mastermind community. And the best part of that is it only takes about 20 minutes a week to implement. Now, while two to 4% a month doesn't sound like much, I show you exactly how we took my IRA from $111,000 to over 500,000 in just 19 months without huge risk. I'm not telling you this to brag, just to show you that you can do this too. So to learn more about this program, go to cashflowmachine.io. That's cashflowmachine.io and you can learn more. My dad and I used to have a debate. Uh, he's, you know, we were, we lived in Florida and there was this new thing called the Florida lottery. And he says, you know, I think I figured out how to beat the lottery. Well, we had two discussions. One of them was to buy every ticket and, you know, you line people up, you know, you have them, you know, 24 hours a day buying tickets at all the different seven 11s or whatever. And, you know, if, if you were the only winner, uh, then, then you had a lock on, on winning the lottery. And if you spent less than you obviously one problem was if you had two winners, then it totally defeated the whole thing. The other one was a cute one. I think you'll get a kick out of this. He said, look, you just buy all, you know, we had numbers one to 45 and you had to get six numbers. And he said, just buy all the combination of numbers, except you eliminate one, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, whatever. And he says, you just eliminate those because they never happen. And I said, that yeah, it's <laughs> ping pong balls. Like the chance of it, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six happening is the same as some other random number coming up. And we just had this fun debate going on. But uh, comment on that? <laughs> well, yeah. So um, as you say, it's ping pong balls. It's random numbers. Yeah. And so low numbers are as likely to happen as high numbers. Now, one thing that's interesting um, not interesting enough to make me buy lottery tickets, but interesting, and that is 
if you bet on numbers that nobody else bets on, most numbers that people bet, I'm not talking about the numbers that come, come up, I'm talking about the numbers that people bet on. Typically, they bet on lucky numbers, birthdays, things like that. Yes. True. So if you bet on, so 7, 13, if you bet on numbers that are not like that, not lucky numbers, not well-known lucky numbers, not birthday numbers, which are 1 through 31, we're talking about day of the month, then your chance of winning is still the same. But if you do win, you're less likely to have to split the pot with somebody. Interesting. And yeah. so, and so that's, a, that's a strategy that's possible. Um, but Until too many people find out about that strategy, and now <laughs> they equalize right. it out, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. As soon as people know about that, they'll do it too. Yep. So, um, and then... Uh, if you buy every ticket, it's not a good idea because it'll take you about 200 years to fill out all the ticket combinations for the Mega Millions lottery if you do it 24-7, three tickets a minute. But uh, there was a lottery in Pennsylvania a few years ago, maybe actually a number of years ago, in which the chance of winning wasn't uh, 1 in 303 million. It was um, about 1 in 6 million. And so this uh, group of people got together and decided they would fill out every ticket. And they did this in advance and they got close. They couldn't, they didn't fill out every possible ticket combination, but they got about 5 million done out of the six or 7 million possibilities and they won. So there's an example of uh, yeah. perseverance, creating the opportunity to win by buying just about every ticket combination. So is it your thesis then that uh, the the creation of opportunity is really what creates the luck? Or uh, maybe a better question is, how can we figure out some strategies to get fortune on our sides? Well, I don't know how to do that because uh, luck is based on chance. Um, so I don't really know how to do that. Some people, are, just by nature of opportunity, what I was talking about a minute ago, some people will get lucky. Yeah. And others won't. And so I, I think that the, a better way to look at it is, is to find uh, situations like playing the stock market um, and, know, and knowing what you're doing, or um, even playing blackjack, where you have a positive expected value and, and, you, and you use a sensible money management strategy so that in the long run, you'll do okay, even if you are unlucky. Luck doesn't really factor in. Um, well, it, it factors in it in the short term. Um, if you don't do that, then you know you'll get lucky maybe, but then you'll get unlucky because luck is something that we can't control, and yeah. it's a part of everyday life. And so, um, I think people should uh, should be happy with luck because you know luck has brought us to where you know genetic um, genetic um, mutations and other um, random features of genetics have brought us, you know, that that's what makes survival of the fittest possible. And so um, we're, we should be happy to be live in a world with so much randomness and um, to be who we are. But again, you have to sort of protect yourself because yes, you might get lucky. Um, I have I have uh, I knew a couple of people who got very lucky and, and they did fine and then after a while they got unlucky and um, so luck is just part of our everyday life yeah and so yeah. we have to just appreciate it and you know I heard a long time ago that this Chinese symbol for luck is preparation uh, over opportunity or something like that so I think the way that we can get fortune and luck and chance on our side is to prepare to do our homework I mean if I had a, a if I had a chance to win a hundred thousand dollars by, you know, hitting a hole in one, I certainly wouldn't go out there without practicing. Right. So the practicing gets the, the luck at least in my favor so that maybe I have a chance of rolling one of those, those shots in versus not being able to hit the ball at all. If I didn't know how to play golf. Right. Well, that's right. And that's an important point. Uh, namely that even if you're skilled and you learn a skill in something, there, luck is still involved in some way or another, maybe less so, but that's exactly right. If you, if you uh, develop skill and do the things like what you were saying, 
then when when luck does enter into the equation, it's it's probably going to be on your side, right? Um, or at least not hurt you too much if you're unlucky. <laughs> you have to be prepared to to stick it out. Um, it, it's really it's really a fascinating topic because you can go in so many ways and and you know I have there are people that don't even want to take chances, right? There's the risk averse people. And then there's the risk taking people. And I'm still not sure who does a better job. I'll give you an example. I have somebody that uh, what used to be in my mastermind group. And this person learned about all of the covered call strategies that I had. But every time there was an opportunity, the person would get scared and go to cash. And the other people who didn't get scared made all the money. And she just kept going to cash and um, and and didn't and didn't make the money. Of course, she uh, didn't have luck long term, and and uh, ended up getting out of the system. So this was a person that that just didn't like to lose money, and therefore was never giving herself the opportunity when the opportunity arose to make that money. So that to me is an interesting thing: is that we have personalities that have evolved to either be risk takers or risk averse in the right scenarios. Right. So that's um, that's true, and um, it's it's important to to have those. To, to, if you're especially if you're risk averse, to have these two uh, facets to your to your strategy, that is um, finding ex positive expected value, and then having using the Kelly system or some other system to manage to have money management. Um, a, a professor, former professor of mine, wrote a math paper, which was r roughly titled "It's okay to make mistakes, but just don't do something that's really stupid," and that was sort of a generalization mathematically of this idea of not betting too much money um, if you have a good opportunity, because then you'll go broke before you get a chance to, to succeed. Right, right. Amazing, amazing. So listen, Doc, how can people find out a little bit more about you? Maybe, uh, you know, read your stuff, uh, figure out a way that they can go a little deeper on this concept that you have mastered. Okay, so um, the name of my book is the story of chance, what's luck got to do with it. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on the Barnes and Noble website. You can also go to my LinkedIn page, uh, Michael Orkin, um, and you will find more about the book and more about me. And um, those are the best ways to get a hold of me. Um, I'm at Berkeley City College right now in the math department in Berkeley, California, but it's easier to get a hold of me through uh, messaging on LinkedIn. Got it. Super. Well, we'll link those in the show notes. Uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience and listeners? Well, I would just I, one of the things I was going to mention is um, the 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 mathematical how, how there are many different situations that involve both luck and skill sure. that sound completely different but are mathematically essentially the same. And one of them is let's just say betting on sports events. Well, if you bet on sports events. Um, you can show using player data, because that's what I've done over and over, that there are skilled players, people who you know. So the question, the question we didn't touch on is what's yeah. the definition of skill? Um, sure. yeah. So I, you know, the definition of luck is clear, you know, it's doing better or worse than average just due to chance. Now, what? so what's skill? So the definite mathematical, a mathematical definition of skill is doing better than average, but significantly better, which means statistically better than just being lucky. So the definition of skill means doing better than being lucky. And you can you can analyze player data who people who played a game enough times to see which ones are skilled in that definition. That uses what's called a hypothesis test. In statistics, you may have heard of a p-value, things like that, um, which essentially measure the chance that someone will do this well if they're just lucky. And if that chance is really low, you conclude that the person's doing better than luck. So that's yeah. that's sort of the standard way that statisticians and others, data scientists is the modern term, um, decide whether someone is doing better than luck using a statistical hypothesis test and something called a p-value. Okay, great. So now I mentioned, I said that I was going to talk about two different things that are 
that sound completely different, but have the same mathematical underpinnings. The other thing is accident proneness. How do you decide if someone's yeah. accident prone? Well, what does accident prone mean? You would think, I mean, there's a lot of controversy. Thousands of papers have been written and the insurance industry has its own definitions, like having a predisposition to accidents, whatever that means. <laughs> but I think everyone can agree that you don't want to get dinged on your insurance because you were unlucky. You should be doing worse than that. So it's like the opposite of the sports betting thing. You want to show if someone's accident prone, you should be able to show that that person's record of accidents is worse than bad luck. And you would do that in the same way. And I had a consulting job a few years ago, um, someone who worked for a very, very large company, thousands of employees across the country. And she was fired because her management said that she was accident prone. And so the attorney, her attorney got me involved because um, I know how to measure things like that. And it turned out that, yes, she had a few more accidents than average, but not enough to call her, uh, not enough to show that she was significantly, had significantly more accidents than average. But then when we called their statistician in, said, how exactly did you compute this average? Well, it turns out this company had thousands and thousands and thousands of, of workers, about half of whom had desk jobs and the other half worked out in the field. <laughs> she it. worked out in the field. Got it. The average was computed over everybody. Sure. And so the mediator threw, you know, ruled in our favor in about a half an hour. Um, and she's still working there. She got promoted as a result of this. Um, and they didn't want, you know, didn't want her to sue them because they were so obviously uh, incompetent, or at least their statistician was. Well, the problem is being accident prone is sort of treated glibly by insurance companies, not all, but by some. And so again, if you want to look at it mathematically, whatever the definition is, maybe there are some people who are predisposed to having more accidents. Um, I'm not counting people who, who take drugs or, or drink a lot. That, of course, uh, is a problem. But um, still, when you get right down to it, you have to show statistically that the person has significantly more accidents than just being unlucky. I don't want to lose my insurance, my car insurance, because I was unlucky. However, if I'm a, a bad driver, then yeah, they've got a point. That is interesting. Yeah. Well, as we wrap this up, I want to kind of uh, just maybe ask you one more question. And okay. that is something that I wanted to ask you a few minutes ago when you started talking about casino gaming. And, you know, I've been sitting at the blackjack table or I, I, you know, watch enough craps to know that there are streaks, right? The statistics might tell you that this will possibly happen, but some, the dealer gets blackjack seven times in a row, which statistically is very, very rare. Or some, somebody sitting there at the table will lose 10 hands in a row, for example, or you get, uh, you get the craps table where somebody, you know, you know, doesn't hit the pass line and just continues to continues to get the role and, and everybody at the table is screaming. How can you explain that? Is it even explained? I think I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. Okay. Well, the answer is that if you, if you watch the crabs table long enough, you'll see weird things happen because we're going back to my lottery comments of the opportunity, given enough opportunity, weird things happen just due to chance and randomness has streaks. If you watch things over and over again, that are purely random, like rolling dice or spinning a roulette wheel, you'll notice streaks. But um, so that's just part of luck or part of randomness, part of chance. But on the other hand, um, there was there have been people um, who are statistically inclined who have watched things like a roulette wheel over and over, and they see uh, watch until some weird streak happens. Now, if you see 10 reds in a row in roulette, what should you do? Well, there are three options. One is you can bet on red because red is hot. Another is you can bet on black because black is due. And another is you cannot bet because randomness has streaks. But there was a guy, so betting on black because black is due when you've seen a bunch of reds is known as the gambler's fallacy. 
It's right. false. It just is, doesn't happen because the law of averages talks about what happens in the long run, not what happens on any particular, in this case, spin of the roulette wheel. But back in the 1950s, there was a guy, a medical doctor named uh, Dr. Jarecki, who was a statistics um, person, type person. He was, he was um, really interested in analyzing data. And he and his friends went to Europe where the casinos were much smaller and not so well maintained and where they don't have a double zero. So your chances are a little bit higher. You, you have a the casino has a 2.7 instead of a 5.3% advantage. Um, and they watched the roulette wheel, just like the example I just mentioned, but they did it big time with lots of people. And they collected lots of data on these roulette wheels in small casinos, and they found that some roulette wheels were unbalanced or warped or not properly maintained. So that's like my simple example. If you see 10 rims in a row, bet on red because there's something wrong with the wheel. Well, now, my example is, is very simple and it's, it's almost surely not the case, but these guys did much more analysis and, and actually found some roulette wheels that were not properly maintained and were not evenly balanced. So there's something wrong with a random number selection. Mm. And they actually won a whole bunch of money. There's a New York Times article about them and everything. There have been a few people in recent years who've talked about doing the same thing, but it's much more difficult nowadays because things are um, better maintained. Before uh, Edward Thorpe wrote Beat the Dealer, he uh, actually figured out a way to beat roulette uh, in the casinos, which I've never been able to. Understand. He had some kind of rudimentary computer where he was there was somebody else that was helping him. And he got banned from the casinos for the first time before he wrote the blackjack stuff. I um, think he was looking for for inconsistencies in the, in the roulette wheel itself, which is sort of like the story yeah. that I, I told. It was where the where the ball exited the drop the slide before it en ended up going in, and he figured out. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Right. So there, there's yes, that's right. So what Thorpe did, I, I believe, was what he did was he had he had some kind of a device where he could measure. Yeah. Um, how fast the the wheel was spinning, how fast the ball was rolling, and and could could tell where it, when the 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 deal the croupier dropped the ball in the wheel, then he could estimate where the ball would land it's just and, amazing to me yeah yeah so he, he yes and they did kick him out for that because he was using um equipment uh like a, he was using a computer to figure things out that he wasn't supposed to do right he was ahead of his time in a lot of respects so uh yeah, it was. yeah. it's a fascinating subject i see why you, i see why you do what you do um but listen thank you so much for your time okay. and your wisdom i really enjoyed the conversation and uh and certainly appreciate your being on Wealth Architect Podcast. So thank you, Dr. Michael Orkin. Thanks, Mark. Anytime. And for those of you that are listening and watching, remember what I always say, never give up your power in your health, your wealth, or your time. And I'll see you next time on the Wealth Architect Podcast. Take care. You've been listening to the Wealth Architect Podcast with Mark Yegi. Follow us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Share and tell your friends. See you soon.